We are coming to the end of our study on the sanctuary, and we're going to do the last lecture now. Before we start, let's also open with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for guiding us through the lessons of the sanctuary. Now as we're going to look at the system of truth, I pray that you open our minds, Father, to see the connections. Um, we thank you for your love for us in Jesus' name. Amen. In this, um, I've added this to the lessons of the sanctuary uh, because of the Advent movement in 1844. So as the Reformation started, you know, during the Dark Ages, and then built up, built up, and reached a climax with Luther um, in the Reformation in the 1600s. Um, it's like it stopped at Luther, and then some of the Re Reformation or the Reformation was not continued. And we see that as truths were discovered in the Dark Ages, remember the little horn was, was trampling on the truth? All right? Remember that in Daniel chapter 8? The little horn was trampling on the truth or trying to blindfold people not to see the truth. The reformers, as they were studying the word, because the word was kept away from the normal people, they studied the word and then bring out the truths of God's word one by one. I don't have that specifically on here, but uh, one by one every reformer brought some aspect of the truth back um, that was lost in the sanctuary. Um, so, when we come now, after Martin Luther, where they didn't finish the work of Reformation, many of the churches stagnated. They didn't grow further and uh, into the truth that God wanted them to grow. So that means they basically stopped in the outer court, if you want to put it that way. So now, comes a new revival in the beginning of the 1800s where where the Bibles were printed, the Bible Society started, and new missionaries were sent all over the world, foreign missions. And then William Miller, that started studying the Bible, studying the prophecies, not just him, others as well with him, and they started looking into the second coming of Jesus. But when it came to the great disappointment, so, during that time of revival, many people came out of the normal churches then to follow this movement called the Advent Movement. So then there was a great disappointment. And now what now? Did we believe the right thing? That's the questions that they were asking for themselves. And as they were, it's interesting, as, as they were studying before the time, this group, even there was a great disappointment. Um, they came together and said, where did we make the mistake? Surely God will guide us in, in, in all the truth. And God did. Very soon after 1844, 22 October, in that very first December, um, Alan White received that first vision. But even before that, the very next day, as those two men walked through that cornfields, right, they received the vision of the sanctuary. It saw what Jesus was doing in the most holy place. And immediately, they went back to the Bible and see if that is true. What is Jesus doing in the heavenly sanctuary? The sanctuary needs to be cleansed. Oh, the sanctuary is not the earth. There's a heavenly sanctuary. And that's the sanctuary that needs to be cleansed. So that's the process in which it started looking at the sanctuary. And as the Advent movement continued until the organization of the church and further on, the truths were discovered within the sanctuary message. The very first one was the Sabbath. One of the first ones was the Sabbath. In one of the visions, the, the Sabbath was encircled with light and so forth. So that was the And the moment that truth was seen, the believers were so in, 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 in touch with God, in so sync with God, they said, I need to look into it. They studied it. I'm going to follow it. This is what God says. Can you believe that? Our pioneers were just different kind of people. God is looking. That's why Philadelphia Church has no rebuke. Because those are our, our Advent movement. Philadelphia. No rebuke for them. God says, I'll spare you against the hour of temptation. I've given you the open door. They've seen the open door into the most holy place. And now the whole system of truth was revealed through the sanctuary to them. 
Listen to these words. First, uh, the system of truth is found in Jesus. Doesn't it? Right, the system of truth found in Jesus. Listen to these texts. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us full of truth. Jesus was, if something is full of truth, can you add? No. Right. This full system of truth is in Jesus. Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. If so be that ye have heard of him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. There's nowhere else to find truth except in Jesus. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I always, when I come to this point with the students, when we're teaching the students, I tell them, I want to do an experiment with you. I want you to read the four Gospels. And take our 28 fundamental beliefs. And see if you can find all 28 just in the Gospels. They are all there. Why? Because Jesus is a system of truth. Jesus has the whole truth. He is the truth. So if you don't find it in Jesus' life, I don't want to follow it. One day I was traveling from... Lusaka to the mission station which was 65 kilometers away from the city through a town called Kafue. Uh, usually you are not supposed to pick up um, officers of the army or officers, uh, traffic officers or whatever. But because transport is so limited in Zambia, uh, these guys stand next to the road and want, want to uh, have a lift. So they won't get you in trouble anyway. So as I get to the town of Kafue, just before I came into the town, I saw these two officers asking for an opportunity uh, to be picked up. So I stopped, and I was alone in the vehicle, so I stopped, and one of them got in front and one at the back of the vehicle. And you know, when I pulled away with these two officers, I looked in my, my mirror, and I saw the guy at the back. And you know, you just get this idea of feeling that this guy wants to ask me a question. Right. I can see that in, 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 as they greeted me and so forth, and I told them I'm from Riverside Farm, you know, from the mission station, and this is what I do. I could see he wants to ask me a question. But he doesn't. Later I realized that the, the, the man that gave, came and sat next to me in front was the higher ranking officer. So he didn't want to ask the question in front of him. But God has incredibly worked out that as we were driving through Kafue, that... This, this man next to me, the higher ranking officer, wanted to get off first. So I stopped. He get out of the vehicle. And the moment we pulled away, the man at the back asked the question. He says to me, now listen to his question. I only told him I'm working at the mission station, the Riverside Farm, which was not far from Kefue, maybe 10 kilometers or 15 kilometers away. He says to me, should we be baptized when we are big or should we be baptized when we are small? Now that type of question tells you, number one, this guy is studying his Bible. Right? He's studying his Bible. Number two, he's been studying the subject of baptism. And he, he's been thinking about baptism. Right? He's been looking at the text and he's wondering what we should do. Should we be baptized when we're small or big. And, and immediately those things flashed through my mind. I realized, well, I have the ability to give him 10 to 20 texts on the baptism, but that's not what he wants. I can give him all the proof in the Bible that baptism should be by immersion. So the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and I turned around while I was driving. I turned around to him. I said to him, if you want to know what is the right way to baptize? You need to look at Jesus. Be baptized the way he's baptized and you cannot go wrong. He, a few seconds later, I stopped the vehicle. He got off. I invited him to come to the mission station, come and see me. But I never saw him again. Now I ask you. That's all 
that man needed at that specific moment. Is to look at Jesus, because in Jesus is all the truth found. So if you look in the Gospels, the four Gospels, you look at the life of Jesus, you should find all truth that you need for eternity. That's what He came to show us. The truth about the Father. Because all doctrine is the truth about God and who He is that never changes. So every single doctrine in our church points to the character of God and to salvation. The center of that salvation is Jesus and dying for us on the cross. And the rest of the doctrines is clustering around that truth. So when we teach doctrine, when we share with others on our fundamental beliefs, please don't attach the grapes from the cluster. Are you with me here? Show them how the grapes relate to the, the center of that cluster, which is Jesus. Then you will see there will be a revival in their hearts, a change in their hearts. They will understand what you're saying. Then the second thing I do with the students. So they look at the Gospels, all 24, 28 fundamental beliefs are there. And more. Okay, I should not say that on... But I believe there's more than 28 fundamental beliefs. We have only found 28. God's word is too deep. You cannot put God in a box of 28. Okay? 28 fundamental beliefs is only there to define us as Seventh-day Adventists, what we believe about the Bible. If you look at the cross, so the second thing I tell the students, look at the cross. You'll find all 28 fundamental beliefs on the cross. That moment that Jesus died. In His death, burial, and resurrection, you find all of 28 fundamental beliefs. Because the cross is the center of all those beliefs. So why would you not find it there? I have a document on it. If somebody wants it, I can send that document. But it's not here. I'm not putting it on here. So Jesus is the whole system of truth. The subject of the sanctuary was the key which unlocked the mystery of the disappointment of 1844. What unlocked the mystery of 1844? The sanctuary. The sanctuary. It opened a view, a complete system of truth. Connected and harmonious, showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement. Right, and again, the last part here. Those who received the light concerning the sanctuary and the immutability of the law of God were filled with joy and wonder as they saw the beauty and harmony of the system of truth that opened to their understanding. They studied the doctrine, finding in the links of truth Precious things that were like jewels that is upon a golden thread. That's beautiful. It's another way of describing it. So it's like pearls or, or, or jewels on a thread, like a necklace almost. All together with that golden string, attached to the golden string. Christ, His character and work is the center and circumference of all truth. He is the chain upon which the jewels of doctrines are linked Okay? To make this chain. In him is found the complete system of truth. They, the Pharisees, were proudly displaying their ceremonies before the very face of Christ. Who was the foundation and center of the whole Jewish economy. While they rejected the antitype of all their types. Substance of all their shadows. Here's Jesus right in front of them. And they reject. The whole system of truth. They reject the antitype of all their types. We need to be careful not doing the same thing. In Him, that's in Jesus, is the complete system of truth. Sorry, I, I need to read this. They need to bring the truth into the sanctuary of the soul. That it may cleanse and refine and sanctify. The truth sanctifies us. It is not theory that they need it. It is the sacred teachings of the Bible, which are not uncertain, disconnected doctrines. 
So it's not doctrines that are disconnected from each other. And that's how we sometimes teach our 28 fundamental beliefs. As, as, as if these are loose parts. But are living truths that involve eternal interests that center in Christ Jesus. In Him is the complete system of truth. In the spirit of prophecy, we have these names that she mentions, pillars, landmarks, signs, and so forth. And let's see what it means. He says, Thou shalt not remove thy neighbor's landmark, which they of old have set, time have set. Now, also referring to our pioneers, the landmarks. Don't change the landmarks. Don't move the landmarks. Remove not the ancient landmark, which the fathers have set. In the Adventist church, as they were going now through the system of truth, God revealing the sanctuary message to them, they came with the seven pillars of our faith. Through searching through the whole book, right, all Ellen White's books, she talks about these pillars of faith. And there are seven of them. Right. In Proverbs 9, 1, wisdom has built a house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. All right, talking about the church. Has built a house. Wisdom has built a house. Wisdom has built the church. Wisdom is the personification of Jesus. In the previous chapter of Proverbs chapter 9, Proverbs chapter 8, wisdom was with God right from the beginning. The Word was with God and is God from the beginning. He has built the house in, 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 in personification here. So Christ has built His church and hewn out the seven pillars. So in God's remnant church, who is going to dig up all these truths presented to the world, we're standing on seven pillars. Here are they. Right? First, the sanctuary specifically, the understanding of the 2300 days prophecy, and the work of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary with a judgment. Okay? It's a unique understanding amongst all other churches of the heavenly sanctuary. There's no other church that proclaims this message. Okay. If you take away one of these pillars, you are not a Seventh-day Adventist. Okay. The second one is the three angels' messages. Proclaim the three angels' messages in the light of the sanctuary message. The law and especially the Sabbath. Okay. The spirit of prophecy, that we believe in the spirit of prophecy. That means the testimony of Jesus, the faith of Jesus. We believe the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, the gospel. We believe in the second coming of Jesus. We have a unique understanding of the millennium. I've never heard it in any other church the same way. I've worked with the Jehovah Witnesses before. I've worked with some of the other churches. They connected to all uh, a, a thousand years of peace here on earth you know I don't know the way they see the thousand years of peace coming if I look at the world today alright um, but anyway there's different ways of seeing it in the world but the sanctuary message gives the right understanding of the thousand years okay millennium and then the state of the dead what happens all these are found right there in that sanctuary message all of them so don't take any of them away. Those are the pillars of our faith. But let's go on. So as I'm going now through the sanctuary, the camp layout, and we're going to look at the building of the sanctuary and then carry on to the furnitures of the sanctuary. What I've done is here, um, I'm going to show you our 28 fundamental beliefs, where it's found in the sanctuary. Okay? Where it's found in the sanctuary. So in the camp layout, we find the church. The arrangement of the camp, right? And Paul says that we are built up as stones for a holy temple, the church. So in the arrangement of the camp, we see the unity of the church, or the church specifically. But we see the unity in the body of Christ in that camp arrangement. And we also see the spiritual gifts in the church through the work of Basileel and Aholiab, building the sanctuary. The white court hangings, we see the experience of salvation and the righteousness of of Jesus. We believe as a church in the righteousness of Christ. As the foundation of our salvation. The gates and the veils. Is also the experience of salvation. 
but those different gates, the justification, sanctification, and the glorification that we see, the way of salvation by faith, going through all these gates. The altar and sacrifices, we see the human nature, the bringing of every sacrifice, testify of our sinful human nature. The mortality of the soul, that we are going to die, we don't live forever. Okay, mortality of the soul, the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. We also see it in the feasts of the Passover, right? And all the offerings pointing to Jesus in His death. We also see here the experience of salvation means dying daily in Jesus. We see the Lord's Supper. We see the marriage and the family through the feast, uh, the feast days and gatherings. And also the peace offering. We see marriage and the family. Um, I should have put here... Uh, in the covenant as well. In the covenant we see the marriage and the family. In the water labor we see the resurrection of Jesus, the baptism, death and the resurrection. The golden candlestick, we see the Holy Spirit's working. We see growing in Christ, we see the spiritual gifts, we see the gift of prophecy. In the table of showbread, we see God's word, the living bread. The eating of the flesh of Jesus, and we see the church, the 12, 12 breads, is the 12 tribes, the church. The altar of incense, we see the experience of salvation, but we see our sins forgiven and taken into the holy place. His righteousness that He covers us with, His intercession for us, and growing in Christ again. The Ark of the Covenant, we see creation there. We believe in creation, not evolution, right? Okay, creation, we see it embedded in the fourth commandment, also in the cycles of seven, right? We see the, the creation that God has made, okay? Um, the great controversy, how God deals with the sin problem and Satan at the end of the controversy, especially in the millennium. We see in millennium the Lord's goat and the scapegoat, uh, the remnant and their mission in the three angels' messages, and the law and the testimony that they proclaim, we see the law of God. We see the Sabbath specifically. Also in the feast days. We see the second coming. When it's finished with the cleansing of the sanctuary. And we see the new earth. And the feast of tabernacles. The feast of tabernacles. In the mercy seat in Shekinah glory. Uh, which is representing the throne of grace. We see the Godhead. In the sanctuary. How can you miss it? The Father... The Son and the Holy Spirit, the Ancient of Days, residing over the judgment. The Son, the center and foundation of the sanctuary. The Son of Man in the judgment. The Holy Spirit, the enlightenment of the sanctuary. Right. The High Priest. We see the tithe and offerings in the system of the priests. We see the Christian behavior. Right. Even our dress reform, our lifestyle, everything is found in the High Priest garments. Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary as well. There's your whole system of truth coming from the sanctuary. The whole system of truth. That is what I wanted to share with you. When you study the sanctuary, when you yourself give Bible studies to somebody else, please bring all the truths that you share with them in connection with Jesus, in connection with His life, Connection with the sanctuary. And they will understand it better. Are you with me here? It will make more sense to them. They are not loose ends. Okay? They are on a golden string. And the pearl, like pearls or jewels on a golden string. And that golden string is Jesus. Which died for us on the cross of Calvary. Stand on these truths from the sanctuary. And you will not be moved. This, the sanctuary message is a bulwark against the error that is out there. And believe me, if I scroll through YouTube, and sometimes I just open up YouTube, you know, and I, I say, let me listen to what this guy is saying about end time event or, or something about the sanctuary. Whatever. You cannot believe the errors that are out there. I, I maybe should tell you one. Just to let you laugh a little bit, okay? So the one, I see the white horse of the book of Revelation, right? I open up, he says, 
I know who the white horse is. Let's see. Prophecy. So he said, whoa, he's going to teach me what the white horse is. So I open and watch this whole video. You know what he says? He says the white is referring to all the nurses and the doctors. Okay? And the bow that the man has in his hand is the, is the, is the um, jab. The corona jab, right? And the, the crown that is on his head, uh, the crown means corona, so that's the, for the coronavirus. So the, the, this, this white horse is, is what's happening now, that people are forcing people to receive the jab. And that's the coronavirus. And all the white, with the white gowns, you know. And I just say, Lord, help us in these last days to understand the truth of God and to present that truth to those that don't know. To study the Bible and bring it to the Bible and show them this is what God says. And to, to rightly divide the word of truth as it is in Jesus. But of course, the truth in love. The truth in love. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the whole system of truth which is found in Jesus. Help us to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Father, there's so many deceptions in the world today. Help us to be grounded in what we believe so that we can share in humbleness with others the beautiful truths of the, your word, your character. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.